Hello and welcome to this revision video for the AQA A-Level Psychology memory topic. Um, as I said, this is a revision video, so what I'm going to do is quickly go through all of the AO1, the AO3 for each of the subsections of the memory um, unit. Uh, if you need more detail, then you need to go back through the video. So I've got a video for each of the sections. So if you need to learn it, if there's a study that you don't know about, if there's more detail that you need, it's going through that. This is to quickly recap um, and give you a guide of, of what you need to know. So I'm going to go through fairly quickly um, on, on each of the sub sections of the memory topic. So, starting with the multi-store model, what you need to know is about the sensory register, short-term memory and long-term memory. You need to know, quite important, is how the information transfers through each of these stores. So, memory comes into the sensory register, obviously through our senses, our five senses, um, and then if you pay attention to it, so that's quite a key bit, that arrow that goes from sensory register into short-term memory, that's attention, um, and if you pay attention to it, it goes into short-term memory, and in when, once it's in the short-term memory, if you rehearse it, so rehearsal, uh, and the rehearsal loop is quite important, it then goes into long-term memory. So three stores and attention and rehearsal are key for the model. Uh, as well as that, you need to know about the duration, so that's how long information can last in each of the stores, specifically short-term and long-term. So information is between about 18 and 30 seconds in short-term memory. That was founded by Peterson and Peterson's trigram experiment, um, and it's thought to last up to a lifetime in long-term memory and that was by Baric's yearbook photo um, experiment. Capacity you also need to know, so in short-term capacity is thought to be seven plus or minus two chunks of information and that was found by Miller and in long-term it's thought we have about an unlimited capacity of memory um, and it's very hard to test that obviously how can you test something that, that's unlimited. Uh, and then coding, you also need to know the coding, how things are are encoded and um, processed. So it's meant to be acoustic in short-term memory and semantic in long-term. That was found by Badley, who gave people lists of words to recall uh, either straight away for short-term or after a little while for long-term. And they found that because it took them longer to, or oh, because there was more confusion when it was the words that sounded the same in short-term memory, that's where we say, well, we must be processing, we must be paying attention to the way that it sounds, so it's acoustic in short-term, and actually their recall was worse by the words that, that meant the same, semantic, in long-term, therefore uh, our encoding in or coding in long-term is semantic. So that's a br really brief overview of the AO1 for the multi-store model. Um, in evaluation then, well, one of the best evaluative points, this is a strength, is all that research that I just said there. Um, so that's a, an evaluative point that you can support the model. It's not just come up with by Axton and Schifrin, who first came up with the model, but there is other supporting research there as well. Um, looking at the specific studies, well, you can say that the Baric study, which is the one into the yearbook photos, that's got high external validity. They were asking people to recall yearbook photos, um, and that's obviously a quite a realistic task that you would be asked to do, so that's a, a strength of that particular study. The opposite is a weakness of the Peterson and Peterson study. So actually, because they were asked to do trigrams, which are three random letters, that's quite low in external validity. That's not a realistic thing to, to do. And so that would be an issue with that study. Um, another problem with the model in total is that obviously Atkinson and Schifrin have just said there there's one type of long-term memory. But actually, as we'll see in, in a second, there's arguments that there's more than one type of long-term memory. So that would go against the model. Um, and another problem with the model is that there's this emphasis on rehearsal. They've said that you have to rehearse things for it to go from short-term into long-term. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You can all think of times where you haven't rehearsed something and you've remembered it in your long-term memory. Um, so as I said, really, really quick overview there. The, those are valid points. Obviously, you'd need to peel or use the Berger method to expand upon. I'm going to be doing that for, for each of the, the subsections, so it's a quick, brief overview. Going on then, so long-term memory, what do you need to know about that? You need to know there are three types of long-term memory. Uh, this was Tolving that said this. There's episodic, semantic, and procedural. Episodic memories are memories of episodes, as the name suggests. Uh, so these are quite personal, these are timestamp, what you did on your last birthday, for example. Um, and one of the key points there is that it's conscious recall. If I asked you what you had for breakfast, you'd hopefully be able to think about that, and, and that would come back to you. Um, the next is semantic memory, so that's facts, knowledge, 
language, knowing that London is the capital of England. Um, that's a fact, it's the same for everyone. And again, there's conscious recall there. If I ask you what's the capital of France, you should be able to think about that and come up with that answer. The final type is procedural memory, and that's kind of actions, how to do something, um, procedures, funnily enough. Uh, that's not available for conscious recall. So you might not know, uh, you know, when you're riding a bike, how you're doing it, you just kind of do it. Uh, so that's pretty much the A1, to be honest. A3 evaluation, is there any support for this? Well, yes, there's the case study of HM, Henry Malarson, who was able to do, he was able to learn new tasks, so he did a mirror drawing task where he could draw around um, objects, um, but he had no recollection of ever having done that task before. So that suggests his he did have procedural memory, um, but didn't have semantics. So that backs up the idea that those two things are separate. However, he's obviously a case study, he's one individual, he had his corpus callosum cut due to epilepsy. Um, can we apply those results to other people? So it's the, the issue there is a research methods one about generalizability of case studies. Um, other support is Tolving himself. Um, there were PET scans done, positron em em uh, emission tomography. I think that's right. Um, PET scans that were done looking at brain activity in different regions of the brain. And what they found was that in um, when they were doing the different long-term memory tasks, they different areas were, were active during the brain scan. So I think it was the right prefrontal cortex was activated during the episodic task and it was the left prefrontal cortex during the semantic task um, and that shows that these these there's not one type of long-term memory they, they are stored in different places in the brain so that backed up the idea that there's different types of long-term memory however Cohen and Squire disagreed with Tolving saying that there were three different types Cohen and Squire just identified two types so they said that episodic and semantic were um similar types they, they call that decorative and then they call procedural non-decorative so actually Cohen and Squire only have two definitions of long-term decorative and non-decorative memory whereas Tolving had the three so who's right and and potentially both of them or, or neither of them so that's a bit of a, a contradiction to long-term memory. Moving on then, working memory model, Badley and Hitch, um, you need to know about the different systems within the working memory model. The first of these is the central executive, this is known as the attentional system, um, it's thought the central executive allocates uh, resources to doing different tasks, uh, there's a limited capacity in our uh, central executive. The slave systems that are reliant on the central executive, one of those is the phonological loop. This is for auditory information, things that we hear. This is further subdivided into the phonological store, which is storing information, obviously, uh, ver uh, verbal information, things that we hear, um, and the articulatory process, and that's uh, processing auditory information. Then you've got the video, oh, I think I spelled that wrong, video spatial sketchpad, um, and this is visual information, things that we see. And again, this is subdivided into different sections. So the visual cache is the store of visual information, and then we've got our inner scribe, which is where we relate different uh, objects in our field of vision to different areas. We, we see where they are, that's a bit more spatial, I guess. Um, and then the other the other system in the working memory model is the episodic buffer. This was added a bit later on in the year 2000 by Badley. Um, and this is thought to be a bit of a store. So it stores all the other bits of information. It brings them together. Uh, this is episodic, episodic buffer. So it's time stamped. So we kind of know when it happens. This is also thought to have a limited <coughs> capacity, which is thought to be around four chunks of information. Is this a good theory of memory. Well, uh, KF, another case study of a brain damaged patient, supports this. So KF had poor verbal memory, but good visual memory in short term. So this backs up the idea that these two stores of visual spatial sketchpad and the phonological loop do exist and are different. The same can be said for what's known as dual task performance. This way you're asked to do two things. Uh, if those two things require two different stores, so if one of them requires you to hear something and one of you one of them requires you to uh, see something, then you're able to do those two tasks quite adequately. If you're asked to do two things that require you hearing or verbal, or verbal information, then you struggle. Um, and that's because the capacity of the phonological loop is taken up by the, the first task. Um, and that's, uh, that's found. And again, that backs up the idea that there are these two separate 
uh, stores the phonological loop visual spatial sketchpad which overall backs up the model as well um, this is also found with the word length effect this was by badly uh, you we are able to hear we are able to process things that we can hear within two seconds. So what that means is we'll be able to process lots of little words, the word has, it, and, but, but one longer word, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, whatever it takes to ta for two seconds. That backs up again the idea that the phonological loop is a thing and has a limited capacity, which is around two seconds. Um, and a criticism of the model is that the central executive is not clear enough. Central executive is obviously a very important part of this model because it's allocating the, the attention and tasks, yet not a lot of detail is known about it. So that's a problem with the model. Um, and then to back up the model, Braver et al. Uh, conducted brain scans um, and they looked at giving people tasks that would require different levels of central executive, so attentional processing. And what they found was the more attention that was required, the more activity you saw in the brain. This backs up the idea that the central executive is a thing and that it does deal with attention because um, it was required more when there was more attention required. Next then we'll look at forgetting um, and there's two sides to forgetting. First I'm going to look at retrieval failure. Uh, this is one of the most popular explanations of why we forget information. So this suggests information has gone into our long-term memory but we're just unable to recall it afterwards. Um, one of the reasons for this is known as the encoding specificity principle um, which is related to cues. So what is suggested is when we remember something we're remembering the item but also a way of pulling that item back out again at a hook um, if you will and so the idea here is that if you can provide that hook if you can provide people with a cue a clue um, then they're more likely to recall the information but if that's absent then they can't so this led to two different types of uh, forgetting in terms of retrieval failure first is context dependent forgetting and so this is to do with the environment so this is saying that the environment that you're in when you remember the information if you're back in that environment you're more likely to recall it this was tested by Godden and Badley uh, they asked people to recall information while scuba diving so they either remembered the information when they were on land or they remembered the information while they were scuba diving and then they got to recall it either on land or scuba diving so there were four conditions basically recall underwater sorry learn underwater recall underwater learn underwater recall on land learn on land recall on land learn on land recall underwater what they found was when the recall was in the same environment as the uh, remembering then the recall was better so this suggests that context dependent forgetting the environment that you're in does have an impact on uh, whether you remember the information or not the other is state dependent forgetting so this is rather than looking at the environment that you're in when you remember and recall the information this is the mental state that you're in the emotion that you have at the time um, so what happened here Carter and Cassidy they gave people antihistamines um, which is what you have when you have hay fever um, and sometimes these make you drowsy so this affected this state of mind people were in so again similar setup they either remembered the information when they had taken an antihistamine um, or not and then recalled it the other way around so you could remember you could take an antihistamine and recall the information when you had taken one and remember it when you had taken one, uh, remember it when you hadn't and recall when you hadn't and vice versa. I haven't explained that very well but you get the idea. So what they found was the same. So the state of mind that you're in, you're better at recalling inf information in the same state of mind as you remembered it in. Um, so this suggests yet yeah, that retrieval failure does happen. Um, so there is lots of supporting evidence for this idea of forgetting. Um, the downside to it is that, in fact, Badly has said, does this actually really have that big of an effect? So obviously the difference between scuba diving and being on land, that's quite a big effect. But, you know, if you were in one classroom and then had to recall the information in another classroom, is that big enough a difference that's going to affect the recall and potentially not? Um, the other issue here, so Badly and God, or Godden and Badley um, replicated their study. This time, instead of getting them to recall, which is remembering it without the hint, they had they had to recognise, they had to uh, give recognition. So they were given a list of words and asked which one of these was on there. And when they did that, um, the recognition was, there was no effect whether they learnt it underwater or learnt it on land. Um, it was the same. So actually this seems to be a, for a very specific 
type of recall. So that's a bit of a, a, a question over how big an effect retrieval failure actually has. And then the last thing, and this leads into something that we looked at later on, but this has got big application, as I said, it may not have an effect, but it may do. So um, you ideally will be recalling information in the same place that um, you remembered it. So it might be worth in the run up to your exams, getting into the exam hall and trying to learn some of your information there because you're recalling it in the same environment. But more specifically, the cognitive interview um, uses information from this. So the context reinstatement um, uses information for context dependent forgetting. That supports the idea that this does have an effect and is quite important. The second theory of forgetting is interference. So saying that one type of information is interfering with another. There's two types you need to know about, commonly forgotten. Just remember it's the thing that's being forgotten um, is or the thing that's being impacted is the name of it. So retroactive interference is where retro old, old information is being interfered with. So new information is influencing old information. The old information is the thing that's being affected. Retroactive interference, proactive, pro, proceed going forward. So old memories are affecting new memories, proactive interference. Um, there's also the idea that similarity has a bigger impact here. So the more similar the thing you're trying to remember, the worse it's going to be. So me trying to remember my the names of people in my new classes each September, um, that's my new information, that's going to be proactive interference. Um, McGeo and McDonald did a test here, they gave people a word list and then had different things that they had to do, um, different sets of information they had to remember. One of them were synonyms, so words that meant the same thing. Another were three random numbers or three random letters that didn't really mean anything. And what they found here was that the closer the, inf the new information they had to remember, the, the worse the interference, the, the worse the forgetting. And so that suggests that similarity has a big role to play on interference. Um, it's been backed up. Badley and Hitch did a study with rugby players, asked them to recall information of teams they played across the season. Um, what they found was the rugby players that had played more matches forgot more information. Now, if it was just that we were forgetting what's happening due to decay, which is the amount of time that's passed, then you wouldn't find that finding. The fact that the more that they had played, the more that they were forgetting suggests that interference is happening. Um, there's high control um, of studies potentially here um, in terms of lab studies that, that have taken place. So the McGee and McDonald one, that would have been a good, um, so good internal validity. Um, however, it was artificial stimulus, so they were using three random letters and we see we saw that with Peterson and Peterson. Common, you get common evaluations um, in similar topics and so this is another issue in, in this part of the spec here. The next bit is uh, misleading information. So this is moving on to eyewitness testimony. There are three points to eyewitness testimony. The first, misleading information. Two key parts here, uh, Loftus and Palmer's car crash study and then Gabbert et al. post-event discussion. Loftus and Palmer, uh, they presented people with a video, really important, a uh, video of a car crash. Uh, and then they asked participants five different conditions, independent group sign, how fast was the car going when it, and then changed the verb. So hit, bump, smash, collide, contacted. What they found was the more fierce, the more um, emotive the verb, smash, they they reported a higher mile per hour than, than contacted or collided. Um, so that suggests that if, you, if they were to be asked that in court, eyewitness testimony, then that might change their recall. Gabba Tezal showed participants um, videos of a crime they paired people up, they showed them the same crime but from different angles. They got them to discuss afterwards and then got them to recall what they saw on their own. What they found was a high percentage, I think it was 71%, um, recalled things that the other person had said. They couldn't have seen it in their own video and they tested this because they gave some people just the video to watch and then they didn't discuss on what they recalled and obviously they didn't recall other information. So this shows that when people discuss information, this could affect eyewitness testimony. This could be potentially misleading information. Do these things have an effect? Um, well, yes, uh, potentially they do. And so, again, the idea that misleading information has 
uh, implications. This is shown in the cognitive interview. They are asked to report everything rather than um, the police obviously asking them questions that could mislead them. Um, you would question the external validity of the Loftus and Palmer study because it was on videos rather than real life car crashes. You know, real life car crashes are several things that, that is very different. Um, the emotive side of it, how long it lasts, um, everything else. Uh, and so that's a problem with uh, that study and again it's a lab study so there could potentially be demand characteristics there there could be a screw you effect they could be giving answers that, that they know they want the, the answer to or yeah giving answers that they know the research is looking for or the green spoon effect they could be just playing along uh, there's another point which is there's big individual differences in misleading information so misleading information can affect different people in different ways one example of that is age um, we're better at recalling information about people that are similar age to us this is known as own age bias um, and so that could have an impact um, if it's younger children or older adults maybe uh, recalling the information then that could have an impact if if the people that they're trying to recall it for uh, were of a younger age. The next bit is anxiety, eyewitness testimony and anxiety. Does anxiety have an effect on eyewitness testimony? Johnson and Scott would say yes. This was the weapon focus study where they had two different groups of participants. Um, one overheard an argument. They saw they then saw someone coming out of a room with a blood-covered letter opener and running off. Uh, and they were asked to recall um, the person who they thought it was. Uh, that committed that crime uh, out of a lineup. Another group overheard a conversation, then some saw someone coming out of a room with a pen covered in grease, and they were asked to recall it. What they found was the first group had a worse recall than the second group um, because the idea was that they were focusing on the weapon rather than the person's face. That's known as a weapon focus and suggests that anxiety has an effect on eyewitness testimony, so that supports the idea. Ewell and Cutchell, however, conducted a real life, they looked at a real life crime, um, it was a shooting in, I think it was a shooting shop, might have been a, just a normal shop, um, and they asked people to recall the event uh, afterwards and looked at how accurate they were, and what they found was actually that a gun was pulled out in this uh, real life crime, but people still recalled the information really, really well. Uh, afterwards. So this actually suggests that anxiety improves eyewitness testimony um, and that it could heighten our senses and that could be explained by the Yerkes dodson uh, inverted U. So if we're really low on anxiety we don't remember a lot, if we're really high we don't remember a lot, but if, if our anxiety is peaked, if there's stimulation there, then it might make us better. <coughs> and that's what the Yule and Cutchell study would suggest. Evaluation then, uh, Pickel looked at the Johnson & Scott study and said, well, actually, maybe it's not because of the weapon that they're focusing on, maybe it's an unusual situation. So what they did here, they had a barbershop and they uh, people were either pulling out, well, there's a raw chicken for one of them, which is a very unusual thing, um, and there was a, a gun as well, uh, and there were scissors and there was a wallet. And what they found was the more unusual the item, so the chicken, that was the worst recall. So that suggests actually it's not anxiety that's affecting eyewitness testimony, it's un how unusual the objects are, and that goes against the theory that anxiety affects eyewitness testimony. Um, there's potentially uh, demand characteristics and artificial um, artificialness to the Johnson & Scott study. It was a lab study, so that's a, an issue. There's also criticism of the, the Yerkes Dodson inverted U explanation. That's too simple just to say, well, it's anxiety or not. There's lots of things going on. There's emotion, there's, um, you know, uh, the outcome, what happens if you get an eyewitness testimony right, what if you get it wrong. That's too simple an explanation to explain anxiety in eyewitness testimony. The, you could also question the ethics of the Johnson and Scott study because they're putting people in a, an environment where they thought they had seen potential stabbing, uh, which is protection from harm. Um, and there's also the issue with lack of control in the Ewell and Cutchell study because that is a real life study. Um, again, you'd need to go into these evaluations a little more. Right, last but not least, cognitive interview. Uh, this guy's on a fissure. Uh, the parts that you need to know about are report everything, context reinstatement, change order, and change perspective. Report everything. Please ask uh, the witnesses to report every single thing they've seen, even if it seems insignificant, because that could help recall. Context reinstatement is where you get into the same mindset, try and think about 
what you were doing at the time, uh, what the weather was like to try and jog your memory. Again, this is to do with that with forgetting cues. Um, change order. So say it from back to front or middle uh, to front or middle to back. Um, and change perspective. What would another witness see? What, what would it look like from above or a different um, environment? These are all designed to jog people's memory and try to make them think of the 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 event better. There's also the enhanced cognitive interview. This is where uh, police are made to make the person feel welcome and relax, offer them a cup of tea, um, and speak slowly and understandably, not like what I'm doing now, soz, um, and to not use maybe police jargon and things like that, and that's again been found to help uh, recall. So there's support uh, via a meta-analysis, um, Conkin, I think it was, uh, and they found that the cognitive interview does improve recall, which is really good. Uh, Milne and Ball looked at the different aspects of the cognitive interview and found that the report everything and the context reinstatement side of it are the most important parts uh, of the cognitive interview. Uh, so if you can do any, you can do them. Uh, an issue is that the cognitive interview is potentially time consuming to conduct. The police officers need good training to be able to do it properly. Um, so that's a problem. And also they found that there was more incorrect statements given sometimes using the cognitive interview, uh, specific, uh, in, uh, specifically the enhanced cognitive interview. And so that could create so, some issues. Oh, and I can breathe. So that was a very quick whistle-stop tour of the memory topic um, and hopefully gives you an indication of kind of what you need to know and what you don't. If there's anything in there that you don't understand, then I've got videos on all of it. So look back through each of those subsections and hopefully that helps your revision.